Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. And on this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with Israel Bacchus of Arcane Design. Israel's science fiction-inspired folders speak in a familiar language, but with an alien accent. His first knife, the Necronaut, is an aggressive tanto, and his latest, the Crawler, is an equally aggressive Warncliffe. And in between came the perfectly symmetrical folding dagger called the Antimatter, which is a uh, is now an obsession of mine. And uh, I've been scheming all afternoon about uh, about uh, you know how I'm going to move some knives around get, to get one because it is a very very sweet thing, and I'm excited that it brings Israel to the show, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. But first, are you crazy about knives? Do you like this show? Well, check us out on Patreon. There are three levels of support. You get Knife Junkie stickers, a mention on the podcast, early access to the Sunday interview, and midweek supplemental shows with pod, uh, with advertisements uh, not to be found, and uh, more exclusive stuff. Your support helps fund the infrastructure needs of the show, hosting servers, apps, and equipment, as well as knives for review and giveaway. So check us out on Patreon and see what helping us gets you. The quickest way to get there is by going to theknifejunkie.com. That's theknifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. Probably. <laughs> Israel, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Bob. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you you busted on the scene with the Necronaut, and it got in the hands of a lot of uh, reviewers, trusted reviewers that I know and like, and mm -hmm. it was a hit. Uh, tell me, how'd you get into this? <clears throat> yeah. So, um, you know, about two years ago, I, I was didn't know anything about the knife scene at all. Um, I had a couple of pocket knives here or there or so, but primarily just wasn't really interested, wasn't really my thing, didn't understand this whole world. Um, and about Christmas two years ago, I was online looking for a pocket knife because I think like most people, once you start jumping onto YouTube, you find all the reviewers, you find really interesting knives that are out there. And uh, I started looking around. I was like, you know, I think I, sh I should get myself a pocket knife. And I was kind of scrolling around, couldn't really find anything that spoke to me. Um, mm -hmm. And because from seeing all these reviews and things like that, I knew that there were thousands of knives and thousands of designs out there, but nothing that really I gravitated towards. And so I decided to myself, you know, it was kind of a cold winter up here in the Seattle area. There's a lot of snow. I couldn't really do anything. And so I decided, you know, how what hard would it be to learn to design a knife? Um, and it turns out it's it's pretty difficult. But uh, luckily, I was I had the time and I had the resources. And so I downloaded Fusion 360, which um, for people who might not know, it's it's a, a 3D CAD software. Um and I watched a ton of YouTube videos on how to design uh, and utilize Fusion 360 and trying to translate that into pocket knives. Um, and so I kind of picked it up from there. And there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of learning and a lot of watching videos to try to understand the components of what makes a knife a knife. And trying to figure out that balance between perfect functionality but also the type of aesthetic that I think I was looking for that I felt was uh, lacking in the market. So I started from there. And then about a year and a half ago in July, I told myself, you know, I have a, a bunch, I have a couple of designs in Fusion 360. What, what am I going to do with these? Uh, and so I decided, you know, it's, it's better to shoot for the stars and try to see if I can create this passion project and, and get a knife designed. And if people want to support that, then great. Like people get to own my knives. And if anything, I have a couple and it fails and I have a couple of prototypes that, uh, you know, I get to say I designed myself. And so I established my own uh, small business and uh, I've been trying to figure out this whole project with uh, 
great support from people on social media and other other yeah. aspects. Uh, it's been a really, really rewarding time for sure. Uh, your designs are very aesthetically driven, very uh, artistic, very influenced, uh, as you've said, by science fiction and classic horror and and that kind of thing. But you also said you haven't been a knife person for that long. Uh, it's, it's shocking to me with these designs. Um, what were you doing before you started making knives? Yeah, so I graduated. <laughs> it's really funny. I graduated with a uh, worthless degree in uh, music, uh, classic performance. And uh, but, you know, uh, and previously to that and still, you know, to this day, I'm, I work as an HR professional up here in Seattle. Um, like I said, this is kind of a side passion project that I'm wanting to develop and turn it into a, a full blown full time thing. Um, so I, I don't have a lot. Of, I didn't have a lot of engineering experience. I didn't have a lot of anything uh, within that realm. Uh, but I did have like this idea of particular aesthetic that I wanted to go for and gravitate towards you know, going through all the research of like looking into knives and seeing what uh, what kind of knife I wanted, I fell into that world of uh, custom knife makers, uh, mm -hmm. seeing these custom knife makers turn these beautiful uh, pieces of art, mm -hmm. this elegance, the type of metals that they were using, the type of design language and the lines that they were using, and then merging it into a functional tool. And I think those two uh, worlds converting with one another was just something that I had never had, I had never seen for. And I instantly had the same passion that I did when it came to writing music. Uh, when, when something just kind of comes together and it's a tour de force of like, just the endless possibility of design, but also the fact that something that brings you so much joy aesthetically could be utilized um, for actual practicality it was just a really cool conversion of two worlds that I had never really seen before. And luckily, I think there was something innate within me with the design language and the aesthetic that I like that automatically gravitated towards knife and knife design. Uh, and so I think uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate in the, the aspect that my design language really caters to towards that tool. So yeah, well, uh, especially when you when you think of classic horror, some of these things that you that are that you point to as uh, as influences. Yeah, knives play heavily in those kind of stories, whether it's about survival, perhaps in space, or against some sort of uh, horrible adversary, or right. or whatever. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that custom knife knives were kind of an entree for you um, when you first started kind of interesting yourself in mm -hmm. knives in knives as something that you might throw yourself into yeah what, what about the custom knife aspect resonated with your musician yeah uh, I think it was just kind of the 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 again the point of conversion of creativity into practicality is something that's mm -hmm. really cool so I'm a person who's like really into self-discipline. Um, I'm, I'm somebody who's pretty stubborn and I like things to be right and there's a right and a wrong. And, and so, uh, but I, also being a, a person who's into the arts and creativity, you realize that there's certain boundaries that need to be broken, certain rules that need to be broken. And it was just uh, almost like music to the sense that uh, uh, it's music is essentially just sound. It's a part of life, but the fact that something beautiful can come out of it and that the categorization of music doesn't have to fall within, you know, the, the eight octave like section or whatever the case is, um, was just really, really cool to me. And kind of this, this whole idea is actually flown out of, you know, the balance of that creativity and discipline, chaos and order. In fact, that's what my uh, logo really stands for, as you can kind of see in the background and on my shirt. Um, the the triangle structure basically stands for, for di the discipline aspect of knife making, the functionality part of it. You know, you have to have constraints. You have to have the right geometry. You have to have 
like actual mm-hmm. physics and science and everything backed by it in order for the structure mm-hmm. and the tool to actually work. But if that was the case and that was all that was important, then nobody would own anything aside from a buck 110. You know, the fact that we crave a different look or we crave a different aesthetic or a different blade shape or whatever the case is kind of lends to the fact that there's something more that needs to be birthed out of that discipline and structure. And that's kind of where the creativity comes from. However, on the flip side, if you have just too much creativity and it's something that's completely unpractical and it looks like a gas station knife, then you you lose the essence of why you created the thing to begin with. You lose the fact that it's a tool that needs to be used. And so here with Arcane Design, I was wanting to deal with something that uh, and, and make sure that my knives were 100% functional, functional, 100% reliable, um, but still had and still played towards the creativity and the aesthetic. And so if you can kind of tell on my on my shirt, that's that's the the discipline and the constraint and creativity kind of coming out of it, the balance of chaos and order. Oh, I love uh, the uh the that kind of talk <laughs> chaos and order and how how order is birthed out of chaos and right uh, that that sort of uh you know you've got the 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 stew the primordial stew out of which uh something more refined is born but it takes totally. it takes that that chaos um what so you're approaching it from let's say initially before you get uh adept at Fusion 360, you said, um, mm-hmm. and before you get, you know, very familiar with knives and knife design and what you want to achieve with that, what were the challenges you saw in in translating your aesthetic ideas into those precise engineering things you were just talking about? <laughs> yeah, totally. I think when I first started, it was like I was reaching for the clouds. I was designing things that. Um, you know, were really interesting and I I draw it out first and then I put in Fusion 360 and then come to realize that like, you know, again, the whole discipline aspect or the actual science and the actual physics of things like, oh, I can't put a stop pin there or, oh, I can't actually like fit this larger blade inside of this handle if if the, the pivot geometry is not in the right direction or in the right place. And And so it was quickly kind of this balancing of like, I really want this look. It's not possible to put it in the way that I want to do it. So how can I give and take and like balance this in order for it to to be functional and for order to still have my impression as a creator into it. And so it was really just shooting for the stars and then kind of railing it back. And um, I think that was it was so humbling because a lot of times uh, when you take a look at knives, for example, and for somebody who is kind of on the outside or even people who aren't designers, if you take a look at a knife, you're like, well, that knife's really cool, but I wish they did this or I wish they changed this. Well, um, to the outset, until you've actually designed a knife or actually tried to put it and make it functional, like more than likely that makers already thought about that. And that was something that they can't actually do practically, you know? And so I didn't realize there were so many nuances and so many things that you had to pay attention to in order to have a functioning tool uh, with that kind of same aesthetic. And I think that balance is kind of the same excitement that I had where, you know, you're wanting to create something crazy and then you have to build, you have to build it within the constraints of what you've been given. Uh, and this kind of dance between both of them was was really, really exciting. To me, this uh, is probably uh, best illustrated, at least from my perspective, in the antimatter. Uh, I have mm. a, I, I like, I really, really like all three of your designs. They resonate with me a lot. The crawler, I'm a huge Warren Cliff fan. Yeah, but the antimatter <clears throat> to me, uh, the the folding dagger problem has been around a long time and yeah. very very few people approach it in an earnest way i mean you get a lot of dagger shaped knives from a lot of the uh you know um you know like kershaws and such but they never ever intend to sharpen the back edge it's just not right. pra- practical for them 
But to me, uh, you know, it's it's you, it's Brian Nadeau, and it's uh, it's it's Rick Hinderer, who have who <laughs> right, have yeah. created who have created like flipping daggers that look practical. But yours is uh, well, all three of the, those designs I'm mentioning, uh, yours as well, perfectly symmetrical. I, I how is that? How do you do that? Yeah, so I, I have one for us kind of right here. If you want to take a look at it. Uh, this is the uh, damn steel version. And, I'll, I'll uh, take a closer look if you want to drop that. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, right on. Um, and uh, you know, it was something. So, so this this knife is a, a collaboration with something obscene company, Felix from something obscene company. Uh, he was one of the very first people that I reached out to to just get a better idea of how to start knife design and a business and things like that. And uh, he, after seeing a couple of my designs, he, you know, really wanted to jump in on uh, a collaboration together. And so we were talking through it and kind of nailed down that we wanted to do a folding dagger. Like you said, the the exact same two people that you said, Brian Nadeau and um, uh, Rick Hinder were the only ones that I really saw I, I was interested in or, or kind of had that same goal. Um, and, you know, I wanted to design something that had actual substance to it. A lot of times when it comes to, and you, you brought up a great point, a lot of times when it comes to folding daggers, it's the issue of making sure that it fits within the handle to be safe. And, and you know and reasonable um with this knife you know i wanted a, a robust you know thicker profile within the knife plenty of uh room for the bevel to go down to a nice um sliceable edge um but without having the chunkiest of handles and so that i think when it comes to the symmetry of this knife um it really is I think, in my personal opinion, the perfect balance between the right type of width here uh, towards the amount of blade that I wanted to place inside of it um, and still make it comfortable. Because at the end of the day, if it feels like a brick in your hand, you're not necessarily going to want to use it or carry it. Um, however, you know, uh, so yeah, so there was a lot that went into actually designing this knife to making sure that it was what we wanted, um, but without compromising and obviously compromise uh, not compromising on safety. So this knife, um, we decided to do a um, majority of the knives came in both dub uh, double edge configuration. Uh, but we knew that there were a number of people that wanted it because of state regulations or whatever the case is as single edge. And so uh, we have some of those as well. So, um, yeah, we want to make sure that we, we offered the gamut to people. Um, however, on both of them, um, you know, there, there's no really way that you can actually cut yourself if you rub on the sides, if you put your uh, finger in the slit, like, we made sure that it was safe enough and and still had the right type of blade width, still had the right type of comfortability within, within the handle uh, to make it something that you actually want to care about. And, you know, this thing, because of the symmetry, and I'm like you, Bob, I, I'm a huge fan of the symmetry. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why we jumped on this. I mean, as my second knife design, you know, coming out the gate, this kind of seems pretty odd, but... I'm a huge fan of symmetry and, and wanting to like manifest that in a really cool way. And so, uh, you know, we worked really hard on making sure that this was a possibility and we're really proud of how it came out. Uh, one thing that strikes me about that knife, not ever actually having it in hand, but just looking at it is the fact that uh, you were, were able to get quite a broad blade. And like you said, Give yourself the that diamond cross section rigidity, but also uh, space enough to get a nice thin behind the edge edge. Yeah. Um, but also the handle itself looks like uh, you know a great shape, and also you want it to be hand filling for sure. It right. has to be hand filling to to accommodate the double edge blade. But but 
that's the necessity part. But for the comfort part, you also want it to be kind of a chunker or not a right. chunker, but, but wide enough, <laughs> yeah, wide enough that, hand. yeah, exactly. To fill the mm -hmm. hand and also to make use of those choils and it's good for indexing and all of that. So, um, yeah, that, yeah, I'll have to send, I'll, I, I have a number of them here. I'll have to send it uh, to you so you can put it in hand and let me know what you think. I will. And I'll make a, I'll make a video raving about it. I already love it. <laughs> cool. No. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, so that is an M390 and titanium, and that is produced by Riyadh, right? Yes. Yeah. The antimatter is produced by Riyadh. So uh, tell me about your design process and then and then this this collaboration process with Riyadh. And do you work with other knife companies? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll start off with the second question. Uh, so for the most part, uh, when it comes to my design, so my first uh, design uh was prototyped uh, with Riot, uh, and then just because I, I initially launched on Kickstarter and that kind of didn't work out, um, moved over to Best Tech because of different type of, um, they, they had, uh, as far as like a smaller kind of company, uh, was able to produce a less, a number of them, um, but still maintain just a phenomenal as equal quality. Um, and so, um, I, this with my first knife design, the Necronaut, and I have one right here. Um, this knife was done by Best Tech, and then for the collaboration, because it was with something obscene company, um, and we knew that uh, there were going to be a lot more people interested in this knife because of the collaboration, we were able to utilize Riot, um, and uh, so. I, both of them came out really, really solid. And then the um, crawler right now, which is for pre-order, this is a 3.5 inch Warren Cliff. Uh, this knife, well, let me put it in there, yeah. This knife is um, produced by Best Tech as well. Um, I cannot be happier with the type of quality that all three of them have come out on. And again, I'm, I'm coming it from it at it from a point that you know, I'm just as much of a knife fanatic and, and fan as everybody else. And the fact that I get to place my designs in the type of quality that I would expect and want to buy is something that's completely built within Arcane Design and it's unwavering. Quality is a huge, huge component of what I want to do because my name is attached to it. The brand identity that I have is attached to it. And because it's a passion project, it's not some sort of, I don't have any sort of ulterior motive. Um, I want the best possible knife uh, and best possible components, um, best possible materials, because these are the knives that I want to own. You know, and I, like I said, I kind of had it from the same start. If people want to join me and want to, you know, take advantage of my designs because they're interested in them, then come, then, then come along. We're going to have a great knife together. Um, so that's that's kind of been my mentality from from day one with this that I wasn't going to do it uh, sloppy. I wasn't going to cut corners. I wanted to utilize the best that OEM manufacturing had to offer because at the end of the day, this is a design that came from me, and I want it to be represented in the best possible quality. So, um, and I, I'm, my, my apologies. What was the second? What was the first question? Uh, I wanted to find out about before you actually do a collaboration. Tell me about your design process. I right. know, I, I know, I know that the antimatter was uh, maybe a different process because it was right, a collaboration. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, detail what what you go through uh, in in designing a knife and then refining the design before yeah. you even send it off. Yeah, totally. Uh, so, you know, what I like to do, like you, like. Uh, some people might know a lot of my designs kind of have this otherworldly uh, aspect where I kind of like to to build worlds in a sense of like if I think of a particular situation or or a creature from uh, another planet or whatever the case is and I know this sounds crazy or weird but um, kind of having that aspects in in like a futuristic kind of idea um, I kind of think of a, a design and a blade shape and uh, something that reminds me of that different world. So I, I uh, usually do pencil and paper first. Um, 
make sure that all of the measurements and, and everything that I have is right. So for example, you know, when it comes to like a first finger choil, a knife, you know, like within this part, I, I usually primarily know that that's an inch and I usually like to keep this portion right here, um, you know, 19 to 21 millimeters thick. So there's a lot of things that like I, once I have this cool grand scheme idea, once I put it pencil to paper, I know the type of measurements that are really good and comforting in the hand. Um, and so that's kind of where the the rubber meets the road or where where the, the big ideas or the big, you know, science fiction driven type of shapes and lines kind of have to come down and be compressed. So then I, I after I draw it out, um, Fusion 360 has a really, really awesome tool that you can kind of take a picture, place it 2D, and then you extrude so you're able to pull out um, all of the, uh, so you're able to pull out and create it in a 3D format. Uh, and then from there, it's just the, the matter of utilizing the proper tools in order to, the proper tools inside of Fusion 360 to kind of create the lines and the shapes and create the bevels create the sharpening edge um, and all those kinds of things. Uh, once I feel like I have a really good solid build, um, I have a, a 3D printer here that I like to print out. Um, I like to print out knives. Um, and because I know the type of like fitting that a, a pivot, for example, needs or like a stop pin or things like that, I'm actually able to create plastic modules in order to put it into hand. So I'm able to actually realize like, oh, this finger choil actually does fit well, or like, ooh, I really overshot that. Or, you know, it's actually really thin and uncomfortable in the hand. Uh, and so that's been a huge help for me because that takes away the amount of like time and money and energy it goes into connecting with the OEM manufacturer to try to prototype something. When in reality, like, man, I wish I could have made so many more changes uh, before I actually wasted their time and my time before we have to go back to the drawing board and back to the drawing board. So I'm able to mitigate that by, by doing it myself here and working onto it until I have a really final form perfect um, file that I can pass along to the manufacturer. It seems like a 3D printer would be an invaluable tool to a knife maker. Uh, whose desire or designer whose process is like yours, you know, and, and I've spoken to a lot of them here on the show and uh, um, uh, many use them. And I think mm -hmm. man, that makes so much sense for exactly that reason. And say you had all the money in the world and uh, you know, you could make as many prototypes as you want still just the time totally uh, in between each iteration would be totally would be really frustrating. Uh, you said something before um, that really resonated with me, especially recently. I recently spoke with Ken Onion, uh, mm. and one of the things he talks about, he talked about on that show, and he says that he relates to a lot of uh, uh, knife makers on the rise, is exactly what you said, design in a theme. You know, his, his example was Mars 2050. What are they going to carry, you know, when, the, oh, cool. when they're building, you know, the mm -hmm. colonies up there, Mars 2050, what are them, you know, that was just a, for instance, but, uh, uh, you know, he, you, you could say, uh, I want to design a whole line of cowboy knives, but using modern uh, right. materials or whatever. Right. Um, I, I, that theme idea that carries through all of your designs. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, initially, the neck or not, again, I didn't know I was going to go into, you know, a different, uh, different designs or anything. I truly just wanted to design this knife because it was the one that I wanted to carry. And like I said, if people wanted to uh, back me with it, great. If not, then, you know, I had prototypes and it would be it. Fortunately, people really like uh, this design and, and wanted to support Arcane Design. And so that was really cool. Um, but when this knife came out, I was thinking, you know, I want to design a knife that would help anybody survive space. Um, and so that's why it's called the Necronaut, which basically stands for dead astronaut. And on each of my knives, they kind of have their own emblem. 
on them uh, to kind of represent and signify the type of character and world building that I'm creating. So this was, if you're ever lost in space, this is the best knife to get you home. Uh, and so I truly designed it that way. I thought the most functional uh, blade within a particular, that type of realm would be an American Panther that was aggressive and stabby, but still robust. Um, so that it has a, a 0.16 millimeter or four millimeter um, uh, stock thickness, but it's still very usable and slicey. Um, you know, I put in a lot of like, uh, tiny like design things and and wanted to make sure that it was functional so um i think that's what's really cool is that you can kind of do this world building and these character buildings uh, so that you're able to you know create something but again it, it just has to be functional it has to be functional it has to work um so yeah but i love that idea about ken onion talking about mars <laughs> i think that's that's so cool for sure would you say that all of your knives are part of the same world? Uh, do you plan on building different worlds? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, I think because I'm, you know, I, I have three knives currently and uh, in the process of prototyping and coming out with a fourth design. Um, you know, my, I think the aspects of it just kind of uh, evolve uh, and it could be that it, it, I do decide to build different worlds. I'm really enjoying the kind of aspect that that really sharp geometric um, kind of space angular features. I'm really enjoying uh, playing in this realm. Uh, and so we'll have to see what the future holds. I think what I want to do with Arcane Design um, is, is really tell a story. So for example, like when it comes to um, for example, let's say comic books are collectibles, right? People are really, really into that. Uh, there's so much into those stories, um, a science fiction story or whatever. They're so into that that they want to bring that into reality. So, like, that's why collectibles are so big. That's why you see people, you know, uh, with comic books or posters or things like that, because it reminds them that there's a different world out there. It, it reminds them that they want to be in something that isn't quite reality for them. Uh, and cause that's where imagination really is. And so I'm wanting to design and build like a view and aesthetic and a story behind each of my knives. So that once a person is able to think about that, once they're able to like think, wow, that's really cool. It would be cool to think of myself as an astronaut trying to get home and survive space. Once they, they think about that and that's a world they want to be a part of, guess what? They can bring it home. They can have it in their pocket. They can have something that reminds them of a story that they wanted to be attached to. And it gives this type of incentive for somebody to not just see this as a knife, but to see it as something that they're excited for that reminds them of something that's different or otherworldly or, or uh, challenges their imagination. And so, and the fact that it's, 100% usable and you could, you know, slam this through a door if you wanted to, like that's, that's what's really cool about it, is that they get to take this piece of this world and put it in their pocket and use it in their world. You know, you, you mentioned comic books and uh, naturally I think of superheroes that there, there are many different kinds of comic books, but people like them because the characters are ar archetypal and they resonate with them, you know, mm. and on a deeper level and and i posit that knives are the same because they are in my life but mm. if you look at the life of humanity the first tool uh but here here you are in 2021 young man designing knives for space you know for astronauts trying to get mm. home it is it is the oldest tool but it still holds you know an immense fascination Okay, so you keep using the word, uh, you, you've mentioned the term usable many times. And that's another thing that, that I bring up a lot is that frequently I'll call someone an artist, like your knives, man, this, this, this is art. And then I have to stop myself and say, no, art is something that you can only appreciate. That's right. its sole, sole purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, appreciate, ponder and all that, but, but it's not for any other purpose. So, so you are, that's why you are arcane design and not arcane art because <laughs> the design aspect is the usability. Right. 
Yeah, I think I think it's uh, difficult to try to ponder that a one thing can be to uh, have two different identities. Uh, like you said, I'm I'm a huge fan of actually utilizing your knives. Uh, it brings me so much joy when I see pictures online of people who have knives that are completely pristine and haven't been touched and they love taking pictures of it. Um, and then I absolutely love when I see so many like scratch marks on the handle, there's uh, scratches in the satin of the blade and stuff. And I think it, it depends on it depends on what you want it to be. And I think that's what's really cool. I'm going to build my knives and I'm going to design my knives in the way that you can choose what you want it to be. It's going to be very visually pleasing if you want to keep it that way. If you want to, to put it in a box and save it, I'm going to build my knife to look like that. And if you want to use the heck out of it and cut as many things and ropes and whatever you need to do with that knife in order to get home, whatever that is, I want you to do that. And so I'm designing my knives and making sure that they're manufactured with the exact same level of both of those identities. So you can pick your poison. You can choose what kind of knife, what, what you want this knife to be. And I think that's, that's a great balance because that puts authority into how you want to utilize this knife, you know, and not necessarily be judged. Cause I know what you're talking about when it comes to beautiful pieces of art, you know, imagine you were at a knife show and you saw a, a beautiful Todd Rexford or something like that that went for thousands upon thousands of dollars and you saw some guy like slicing open some like really tough box and it just the knife got completely destroyed or aesthetic. And not, not to say that Rexford doesn't design his knives for that, but if you saw a beautiful grail, grail, thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of knife and saw somebody just completely disregard it and use it like it was a $20 Gerber, your mind would, your mind would melt, right? Because you're like, what are you doing? That's not what that's for. Um, and so I, I wanted to design uh, something that people felt like they had the value, they had the, the quality um, as far as aesthetics wise and materials wise and things like that but equally they have the usability and they can choose. I like you really like the aesthetic of a used knife. Um, mm. You know, the snail trails on titanium, that kind of thing. Stripes right. And such, but I have a, you know, a, I don't want to say it's out of control because it's not compared to some people, uh, but I, I have quite a few knives and, and I don't end up carrying or using any of them that much. Of course, I have my go-tos, my favorites and such. Yeah. But, so I was thinking, well, just during this conversation, how cool it would be to say on a knife, well, definitely it would look cool on a knife like any one of your three, uh, but to have some sort of light, like really light anno that, that wears off with, <laughs> you know, with, with very little, uh, yeah. You know, Kind of like the paint that Cold Steel used to put on their blades in their Aus Eight days, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A yeah. piece of sausage and a piece, of, and there's like a streak of paint missing. Right. Build That's that into the head. You'd, you'd have, you'd have instant, you know, instant skull <laughs> built into your knife. I'm just thinking of the poor dude who's eating that sausage and is eating all of that paint <laughs> coating with it. That's hilarious. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, you know. I don't necessarily know uh, as far as like materials. I mean, any, any material will have wear and tear and stuff. So it's just a matter of how somebody pushes their tool and, and how much they really don't care at all. Um, but that would be really interesting to see if you do such a light anno and it's basically satin underneath of the titanium handles that if you put a, a ring finger on it and just accidentally you know, move your hand to the left that it's just a huge gash comes to the side. So perhaps, perhaps you got something going on, Bob, perhaps you should get into knife design and uh, create something like that. It, it'll be called the, the, the DLA, the DeMarco light anno. And, and it, will be, <laughs> right. it will be the, <laughs> the go-to. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you've been you've you've had three successful designs now you're working on your fourth which i which if you were 
if what you were holding up was any indication, looks like it might be a clip point. Like a yeah. clip point tanto, maybe. Yeah, uh, this one, you know, I, I'm still kind of working out all the bugs and stuff, but we're going into uh, prototyping really soon. This is called the Abyss. I wish the light wasn't so harsh to catch it, but yeah, it is a Bowie style uh, tanto that's going to be a compound grind, so it's going to have a hollow grind uh, mm -hmm. here, and then more robust flat grind at the top. Um, 3.5 inches overall length is going to be a little less under um, eight inches and more details to come on that. But I'm really liking how this prototype is coming out and uh, we'll go from there. But yeah, this one's called the abyss. Um, and again, it kind of is that style of science fiction, um, the void, that kind of like exploring the unknown and discovering that it's, it's aesthetic is kind of what I was going with this. So. Well, the harsh lighting against the uh, the the dark backdrop of your shirt really highlights that blade shape. And I got to say, uh, I'm a sucker for a, a Bowie. And uh, that Me clip, too. the clip shape that you have where, where there's like a, a little steep drop initially and then it and then it goes down to the point. I yeah. love that. It reminds me of uh, I'm not sure what kind of uh, maybe it's the uh, maybe it's that uh, that British style uh, when they were making them in. Well, yeah. Anyway. anyway, I really like the shape of that blade. It's very thanks. I appreciate great. it. I'm excited to kind of put more information out on it. Again, it's been something that I've been working in design for in Fusion 360 for a couple of months now. So I'm really excited to start picking up uh, prototyping on it. Uh, before we leave design, uh, it occurs to me. So you you don't grind out knives. You're not making them in a shop. You're designing them and they're being produced. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, which, if I were to ever go into knife making, that's probably how I would do it uh, <laughs> personally. Uh, yeah. but, in, but in any, well, yeah, because it, it seems like, uh, um, well, it just seems like the way I would tend to work. Uh, sure. But in any case, uh, um, what I'm getting at is materials have, when you initially started designing, you probably knew less about the materials. How, how much has designing these three knives and getting prototypes and kind of talking with, with Riyadh or Best Tech, how much has, has that process taught you about materials that if you had a, that you might have been learning in a different way? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's so much knowledge out there for people to grasp onto and you don't realize how much knowledge you've actually stored by watching a ton of videos or reading uh, until you actually have to implement it and choose materials for the knives that you want to utilize. Um, luckily, I was able to um, kind of figure out a lot of that when I first started design, uh, when I first started um, like buying knives. So I kind of had this period of when I first started designing knives, then that means I was into knives. So I started buying knives. I think the first knife that I got was actually a, a gift prior from my wife, which was a, uh, it was the Kershaw Leek pan onion design. And that was the first one that I liked. I'm like, man, this is really cool. Like, and then I utilized it a couple of times. I, I don't, I don't remember what blade steel they used. It could have been OS 8 or, I think it's Sandvik 14C28N. Uh, that's the one. That's the one. And I remember going on there and like utilize, like cutting my knife and stuff and then realizing, oh, after a certain amount of strokes, like it was, it was pretty dull. <laughs> yeah, or like, how do I sharpen it? And then I started looking up like, hey, what kind of blade steel do I actually have in this knife? And then seeing like there's a, a cut test and things like that of how it lasts and where it stacks up. And um, there's an awesome YouTuber uh, I forgot his name, but he does this awesome thing where he takes knives of all different types of blade finishes and with particular makers like Spider Co or whatever the case is, however they heat treat this particular metal. And he does passes uh, on like really thick, I think rope or whatever the case is. And like, that's awesome. That's not completely definitive as far as like what works scientifically and like what is the best deal to balance the edge retention with the strength of the steel and then this the the stainless aspect of it um and so i and think the geometry, 
Right. And I think we're still trying to figure all of that out is what is the ideal. Um, and I love the fact that, that we're trying to constantly pursue in on that. Um, so yeah, that like, I, I learned a lot about the types of steels that there that were out there. I really, really like S35 VN. I'm really impressed with, uh, C, um, 20 CV because I, I won my, actually my first big purchase knife was a hinder eclipse Tanto. Um, and it was, um, CPM 20 CV and like really loved that knife realized it's pretty difficult to sharpen. Like once you kind of have to figure, you have to figure it out and make sure that you know, like what you're getting into. Uh, and then throughout that realizing, like I wanted really solid edge retention. I want something that was really strong and durable. And so majority of my knives have been M390, which is obviously the equivalent of 20 CV. Um, it's kind of that higher price point bracket, but I think the people who are wanting to buy the knives again, like to know that the steel that they're getting is kind of what is um, currently the top um, as far as like quality wise. Uh, and not to say that that other, you know, other knives, uh, other blade steels have their purpose and their function 100%. You know, it depends on what you're utilizing it for. Um, but I think for me, I was wanting to do something that was more state of the art and, and, and what I felt had the best edge retention with the combination of um, uh, being uh, resistant to corrosion and uh, just kind of that strength and durability. Yeah, uh, you, you know, you definitely want to get the most premium steel you can for, you know, it's a, it's a, it, they're well-priced knives. Uh, you mm. know, um, uh, what I mean by that is they're expensive, you know, they're, yeah. they're, yeah. they're, they're production knives, but they're small batch. They're, right. they're um, what do you call it? Uh, artisanal. <laughs> That's not the right <laughs> yeah. word, but you know, they're, they're small batch <laughs> knives and, um, and you know, you have to charge a premium for them just right. due to right. that. But at the same time, uh, people don't mind paying that premium if they love the design, they mm -hmm. love the manufacturer, and they they know that the materials are on point. And M390 is a winner every time, like 20 CV. And then yeah. someday those will go the way of 440A, you know? And oh, like, no, oh, yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. I'm waiting for the day when I'm old and gray and people are just laughing at me that my first knives were an M390. Yeah. Hopefully we'll have some something crazier than that for sure. Yeah, it'll be some sort of captured plasma, you know, that you can mm -hmm. put through anything with. Uh, so uh, functional criteria, we know your criteria aesthetically and, and thematically, but uh, just tell us, tell us what you consider uh, essential criteria for one of your knives in terms of the function. What do you want it to be able to do? Yeah, so... Um... What I would say as far as like, hand, one of the things that I really focus on is blade to handle ratio. I want to pack as much blade as possible into a knife. Um, and like, so for example, uh, the crawler is 3.5 inches. I really love 3.5 inch because, you know, it's legal in most places. Uh, I feel like you have a really, uh, a lot of blade uh, that you can utilize in that. Um, and on, honestly, from the exact start, I mean, from right here, you're talking about a 3.4 inch cutting length, um, with a 3.5 inch blade. So I, I did as the best I could to get as much edge on there as possible. And, uh, when it comes to handle this right here is 4.4, .4, uh, inches which is like, usually it's like 4.5. So it's like rounds into eight or so, but I, I am working as hard as I can to make sure that I am putting as much blade as possible. So when it comes to this knife, uh, let me put it right there. When it comes to this knife, uh, I'm really proud and happy of how much I was able to stuff in here because it's a big, tall, beefy blade. Um, but it's not taking it doesn't have the equal amount within the handle and not that like the handle can't be larger and can't stick out or so, but I'm trying to make sure that it is as sleek of a profile as possible for what you're wanting to get. 
not that this knife is very sleek in the profile. I understand it's a large, tall Warren cliff, but um, that's something that I really function, uh, that I really focus on. Another thing that I think I really focus on is primarily the um, backstop, or sorry, the um, stop pin. Uh, usually I am using uh, four millimeter stop pins, which a lot of people would think is completely ridiculous. You don't need that thick of stop pin on the back. Um, but I really, really like knives that have a stop pin that's robust because I feel like it gives off the uh, feeling and you know that this knife is going to really be secure with a lock bar, with, uh, with a lockup. Additionally, I have a, a steel lock bar insert inside the knives that I think is a must now in the modern knife world. Um, and that's due to the fact that I, I want to make sure that lockup is as solid as possible. Another key feature of something that I really uh, have in mind is the um, thickness of the blade. Now, obviously, that will change depending on the design because, you know, you can't have like if you're like going to have a really low uh, bevel, primary bevel on a design and you have a four millimeter thick blade, like it's going to be a chunk. You're not going to be able to do a lot with that and stuff. So like obviously trying to make sure that there's a good amount of space for the bevel to actually come down to a sharp fine edge is really important. Um, but I really like to have a robust, um, a, a robust blade. And then I think the other main component um, when it comes to functionality or so, and this is something that I know a lot of people will disagree with, um, is the actual where the clip is. Um, and so let me kind of, gosh, I wish I had something to show because it's, a, oh, here we go. This is perfect. So uh, when it comes to the knife, like I understand people like, really deep carry um and you know there's obviously reasons to have deep carry um but in any a aspect that i've needed to pull out my knife to use some uh, to to cut something or to whatever the case might be i've always wanted to have something that i could pull it just and in, and it's like you know just the first top of the finger it's not huge at all and so the the, the knife actually sits about like this in the pocket uh, I've had really low, you know, basically really deep carry pot pocket knives. And for some reason, it was not like in the right place where it was almost more of a pain to pull out. And again, that could have been the clip. That could have been the particular knife. And I'm, I'm not here to necessarily argue one against the other. But at least for me, that was something that I specifically designed with the function of like actually getting a great grip on your knife especially because it's a more expensive knife. It's, it's uh, something that you should, um, you know, you don't want to, it to fling out or you don't want, you want to make sure that you have a really solid purchase on it while you're going for it. Um, and so I think that would be a couple of things that I would say when it comes to the functionality of the knife, uh, things that I've really kind of paid attention to, to make sure that it was a knife that I wanted that still had the ethos of being a robust user, uh, but still mixing within the functionality of it. Two things about the clip. Uh, you might want to show it off. It's an expensive, it's a luxury item. You know, uh, that's, that's what sure. we collect, um, you know, unless we're collecting buck one tens and even those today are luxury items. So, right. uh, you might want to show it off a and B, um, Oftentimes, I find deep carry clips, uh, though I might want to be discreet, uh, deep carry clips often are uncomfortable. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they, they end up biting you in the wrong spot uh, or whatever. And right. on, the, on the tail end of the, uh, that was the Necronaut you were holding, yeah. I believe? Yeah, this is on the Necronaut. On the tail end of it, it kind of tapers there. It, it's, got that, it's got that facet that yeah. the clip is attached to. So, you know it seems like it adds a little bit of girth there and uh, it looks like it's uh, you know, perfect placement. Is that a criticism you've received on, on? Yeah. I, I think initially with this knife and I think people were just trying to figure out what my company really like wanted to do as far as design uh, after this knife, you know, and I, I kind of just talked about like, no, I, I want to place it here specifically. Um, 
you know, and I want to make sure that there's at least some sort of form of purchase to kind of pull it out and feel like you have it. Um, there hasn't been any criticism thus far after that with the next three knives that I've done or the, the next two knives that I've done. And so um, I think that's something that people maybe just accept it as reality. And not to say that I won't do a deeper carry pocket clip because, you know, the world's in, is our oyster. We're able to design and, and figure things out. And if a particular knife, you know, is suitable for that, then great, let's do it. But at least for the knife designs that I've come out thus far, it really hasn't been the case. And um, people, for the most part, once they get it in their hands and put it in their pockets, realize it's not as big a deal as, as people think. Well, uh, I, I have to say one of the elements of your designs that I like especially is that they all have uh, uh, a bit of menace to them. And, mm. and and to me, you know, that's, that's I, I like that kind of, I like yeah, that aspect of a knife. Too. A, I like a tactical knife. I like, like weapon-y things, even though I'm not, you know, I'm a nice and peaceful guy. Right. Um, but uh, so... In the in the time you've been doing this, what does an HR professional such as yourself feel about the knife business? How how has it been starting up a small business in this market, uh, in this knife market? And yeah. uh, you know, how, how has that been? How's that going? Yeah, you know, I gotta say uh, the knife community is is just it's overwhelming how supportive people are and how people are cheering you on. Um, you know, I've been in other industries uh, that that's really not the case that people are more looking for your demise or think that there's too much in the market or whatever, you know, that mentality is. Uh, but within the knife industry, so for example, when I first was getting into it, I uh, messaged a lot of people you know, people that were well known, like Felix from something I've seen company, a couple of other people reached out to them and just asked like, Hey, how do you do this? Uh, you know, like, how do you design, for example, or like, how do you connect with an OEM manufacturer or, or what's a good price for this or that? Or sh should I do it independently or should I sell my knife designs? And is that a better way of approaching? Like I had so many questions that I think most people do when they're wanting to jump into this. Um, and the fact that literally every single one of those people messaged me back um, was just awesome. People gave me some great insight. I mean, I keep saying it, but uh, Felix from Something Obscene Company, um, he had no clue who I was and he gave me his phone number and said, call me. And we had an hour and a half conversation where he gave me so much information that I was just, I was so taken aback. I, I had no clue the type of generosity that the knife industry, at least in this kind of small market, you know, people trying to build on passion projects actually had. Um, so that was really, really cool. Um, when it comes to the market and like people, you know, how it's treated people, perhaps I'm not the best person to really ask. I think like bigger companies like Kershaw or, or uh, Spyderco would have more data as far as like sales with their retailers and things like that. From my experience, and I know this time for some people who might not have jobs or it's been a really tough time with COVID and all those kinds of things. Um, from my experience, uh, the people that I have been able to connect with and who are wanting to be a part of this project that I have and wanting to buy a knife and support my designs, um, it's it's been overwhelming the amount of people that have actually done that. So, um, you know, I think if you design something that people are excited about, uh, design something that conveys a story but also has that functionality, um, you're going to find support. Uh, and that has been my case um, from this last year and a half or so that I've actually been doing this. Um, and I can imagine that that's going to be the case uh, from here on out, as long as, you know, I'm designing things that people are interested in, that I uh, make sure that I give the exact same amount of type of 
gratitude and openness that people showed me, um, then I think the, the future of the knife industry is going to be really, really interesting and comprised of a lot of different facets. It's not going to be a one track kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Is that what you would say to someone in your position three years ago? Yeah, um, I, I really would. Uh, again, I was uh, really blown away by how relatable, by how um, open people were to actually giving you good information. Um, whether it be you are a person who wants to just design and reaching out and finding people that do that. If you're a person who wants to learn how to start making customs or fixed blades or things like that, reaching out to people. Um, you know, I, I think our community is small, but mighty. Uh, and not necessarily small in the sense, but like, you know, it's not very common that you walk out, out in the park or something and are able to like find a knife nut. You know, somebody who's willing to throw three hundred or a thousand dollars on a knife or whatever the case is, like, it, you know, so it's kind of small in that sense, but it, it's a really, really awesome community that wants to raise people up. Um, and, but it's one of those things that you have to build trust within the community um, because as fast as people are willing and ready to uh, help and to cheer you on, you know, if you do something to misplace that trust or you uh, have bad business practices or you don't put, you know, the quality or whatever the case is in there, it's a, it's an unforgiving place for sure. And so realizing that I have the responsibility and the opportunity to, um, serve this kind of really awesome community with designs and, and hopefully get my name out there is one that I don't take lightly because it is a responsibility. If I'm putting myself out there within this really generous community and am saying that I have a particular product that has a particular quality, I, I better back that up. And um, I'm really excited that people have given me the opportunity. I, again, like when it came to my first design, I, was literally so unknown it was insane like i didn't have a lot of instagram followers so some people found me from my kickstarter i was like all right let's just try to see and wing and hope and a prayer that that people will be interested in enough and i had no clue uh that people would trust me so for example like pre like i did pre-orders i i do pre-orders um if you were to ask anybody, hey, or if you were to tell anybody, hey, um, I have a product. It's not in existence yet. It's going to be $300 to $400. And in four months, you're going to receive it in the mail. You don't know who I am, but you, you think that what I make is pretty cool. Like, there's not a lot of people that would actually jump on that in any other realm. And the fact that so many people trusted me with my first knife design and I was able to deliver on that is just like, it's so, so cool. And so to realize that people have as much respect and a desire for me to succeed uh, within the knife community, like uh, you cannot take that for granted. You really can't. Uh, I think it was a smart move for you to get uh, the Necronaut in the hands of the likes of uh, Eugene Kwan, I remember he's the first one I saw. Um, yeah. Uh, but a, a number of other YouTubers, uh, at, I mean, I guess yet they call them influencers for a reason. Uh, <laughs> right. And, uh, and you know, and like you said, the knife world is a small and dedicated and self-policing environment. And, yeah. and you know, if, if one of these trusted YouTubers gets on there and is just like uh, talking up a knife, and and it doesn't pan out well he's his reputation is gone your reputation is gone right. and and trust is gone and trust is like is the key ingredient in any economy you know totally. trust you got to have it and um so speaking of economy how do people find your knives and buy your knives yeah yeah so um my knives for virtually currently uh are on arcanedesign.co uh, if you're on Instagram or Facebook, the link is in my my bio, um, but you can go on there. It is usually a pre-order option, but when it comes to my knives, 
if they haven't already sold out within the pre-order, uh, I usually have some on the site for immediate purchase. Um, currently right now, the crawler, uh, this one right here is on for pre-order. What's been really cool is that about two weeks ago or so, we secured funding for this one to happen and to completely go into production. So we've already started on production. This is a guaranteed project, uh, but we're leaving the pre-order open in case people want to jump in uh, with the special price. Uh, and that's gonna be open for a couple more weeks. And then as far as uh, the antimatters, we have these up uh, on site for avail immediate purchase. And uh, we have a lot of configurations and stuff. So, um, but yeah, that's the best way to kind of take a look and get more information on all the knives and the, the upcoming uh, projects that we're gonna be doing. Great. I mean, uh, before you held up the, the Damascus um, antimatter, I was set on the bronze and black, which is probably what I'll end up going with. Uh, but man, because I'll use it, you know, right. use it, take, take it out on all my ops and missions, right. <laughs> my suburban yeah. dad ops. Yeah. Uh, Israel, thanks so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's a pleasure uh, meeting you and talking about your designs. I think they're awesome. Um, you know, it, uh, I have to say before this podcast began, the Necronaut was uh, my number three. Now it's uh, competing for my number two design. I think they're all really, um, really compelling and to me, beautiful and menacing. And they, and they all speak a similar language. And, and uh, I think you have a style now. I think, I think two is happenstance. Three is a pattern. Now you're working on a fourth and right. it, it looks like an arcane design knife. Thanks again for coming on the podcast, sir. Thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Visit The Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. I love that kind of story. Uh, someone who uh, approaches the knife world from somewhere else, uh, you know, for Israel, it was, it's music, it's his HR career also, uh, but... Um, just taking those those things learned in other creative um, outlets and and synthesizing them in knives, you know that's what I love. And um, you know, if it weren't uh, as Israel said, if it weren't for a very uh, open community and community that's willing to share uh, but doesn't tolerate much nonsense at all, you know, he might be still uh, just hacking around uh, at his notebook with no knives in production. Again, you can go to his website and uh, and you can get the antimatter or also, uh, you know, immediately or get on the crawler pre-order. Uh, thanks again for joining us at the Knife Junkie podcast. Please tune in next Sunday for another great interview. Uh, it's been my pleasure as always. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.